Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone out there. We are live on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube. Hello to the first living room conversation by Live Forward Institute. My pleasure to be the host for you today and even more so really excited to have Eric with us um, who we will have here on the show in a few seconds as well. Before we get going, just a few words around why is it a living room conversation? What are we doing here? Um, and basically this conversation fuel ideas. So we want you to be engaged. Please put comments and questions in whatever medium you're using today. Um, make sure you engage with Eric and me so we can get a bit of resonance and connection with all of you. And then hopefully also getting that catalytic power of conversations going that we are aiming for from the living room conversations. And obviously for you listeners out there, uh, we want to give you the opportunity to really chime into what we are talking about today. We'll talk about teal dots in an orange world, specifically in the life sciences industry, because Eric and I are both having a bit of history there. What is teal? What is agility? What is future of work looking like in that setup? And then obviously there's for the future conversations in the living room, there will be more guests coming, speaking about that very same topic with me or other hosts here as well. And we just try to inspire the rest of you to maybe take a first step or two in that direction and create a future of work. With that, no further ado, we'll see Eric here with us in a second. He's the author of two books. The second book is called Teal Dots in an Orange World. Some of you might have read it. If not, you should probably do that. What I find really interesting about Eric, he says um, he's a futures thinker, futures with an S, so it's plural. There's more than one future maybe, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about what that means for, for you, Eric, as well. And um, obviously looking forward to a conversation about Teal in that mostly orange world of well-organized big corporations in the life sciences industry. So with that, Eric, uh, hopefully you're coming on stage now with me here in the living room, and maybe you can introduce yourself really briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you, everybody. And hello from, from Copenhagen. It's raining and pouring cats and dogs right here right now. <laughs> uh, it's uh, two minutes past two in Copenhagen. And I'm really, really pleased to be here. Uh, I have been looking over your shoulders, uh, Tim, and the uh, Life Sciences for a couple of, <laughs> well, for some time. We've been really inspired on what you're doing. So I, I really hope that we can have a good conversation. I am, uh, I'm looking in Copenhagen. I spent my time on uh, advising. Uh, well, right now it's uh, it's the heavily regulated industries on how to grasp the new ways of working. I have been working with that for some years, both as a leader, as project manager, program manager, uh, department leader, uh, uh, technical uh, technical lead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And more and more, I have been just uh, inspired by how we can create. Uh, futures <laughs> in plural for us and how, how we can navigate and balance that. And that's what I, what I spent my life on. Yeah. And I write books. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Really good. So here we go. We are in our little living room. Uh, mm -hmm. Teal dots in an, in an orange world. Eric is uh, your latest book. You're writing on a third one right now. So um, that that uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about in a minute as well. But before we go there, so in, in the Teal Dots in an Orange World book, you're also talking about um, some paradigms, uh, some some uh, key aspects that one needs to look into if you really want to make that shift towards the future of work or actually the futures maybe in plural mm -hmm. for many other things. Mm -hmm. So how about we kick off the conversation like that and just have a look um, about, well, what do these nine actually look like? And then we take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what I have what I have um, observed in now we are we are aiming at the life science world at some point, but let's just go back like five or ten years to see what actually happened in the finance industry or in the software industries. Uh, they were they were em embracing what we at that point of time called disruption. And maybe some of us really d dislike that word because it has become a cliche and we were it was really worn out. But the, the reaction to the disruption was that people were rethinking what is work, what is leadership, what is culture, what is agility, and stuff like agile and stuff like flatter hierarchies and sociocracy and holacracy and lean startup uh, b began popping up in those areas. And what I'm observing right now is that those aspects are moving dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig into the highly regulated industries. So I, I am 
I can see like we what I will call second wave disruption taking place in the highly regulated industries where they are considering uh, flatter hierarchies, more progressive leadership, cultures, uh, agility uh, in a new way. And one of the things that they are inspired by is, uh, for example, Teal, the paradigm, the, the thinking of a more humane workplace based on wholeness, based on self-leadership, based on uh, evolutionary purpose, which is uh, the three breakthroughs in, uh, in Teal. Um, and that is what I have been studying for, for some years working. I do have a background in, in life science industry, uh, knowing all from the process and the QA, QC and all that, uh, uh, working in Novo Nordisk at that point in time. Um, so I, I can actually see that they, they, are, they, they are looking at how can we balance this rigid uh, and professional, um, uh, highly regulated way of working and then right next to that, have something that is more humane, more fluent, less planning, less rigid. And that balance is exactly what I have been, been, been diving myself into. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not coming from Novo Nordisk, but growing up here in Switzerland, then uh, obviously there is uh, also a lot of farmers. So I've been working for Roche Pharmaceuticals a while. So that's, that's my farmer background, I guess. Um, so Eric, from your experience, um, or what I've seen in the past is there's, there's that compliance, that regulation uh, beast almost. That's that's always kind of the reason for not moving faster for more, uh, well, agile processes, I guess, to a certain extent for iterative ways of working, but also for the humane workplace and the humane leadership. It's 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 almost like it's an excuse. So what's your what's your point of view on that? Is it really contradicting each other, or how how would you see that? Uh, I think it is con contradicting each other, and that is, I think, that is the reason for something like uh, we want to go agile from top to bottom, uh, and we want to go teal from top to bottom. I don't think it is going to happen because there is this built-in contradiction. Uh, what I have observed is going to work is when you, and alluding back to the title of my book, to have teal dots somewhere over here we go teal over here we go agile over here we go new ways of working over here we go flat but tying all these pockets all these dots together we need something that is a bit more rigid a modern version of the orange hierarchy of the orange way of of gluing things together so if if you take like uh, uh, teal and uh, gary hamill's book humanocracy uh, and where he, they focus on the modern bureaucracy. If you kind of combine those two, that's how I see it. Um, I do know that, uh, speaking of Roche, um, Bill Anderson uh, has been talking about uh, Teal on a grand scale, which I actually genuinely like. I like the philosophy of the wholeness, of the self-leadership, of the uh, of the uh, of the purpose-driven um, uh, activities. But seeing that in practice, I can only see that happening in small pockets. And we might come back to how big a pocket is, mm. but I can see that happening genuinely in pockets. That's uh, so. That's the contradiction. So I'm, I'm fully with you, Eric. I think uh, like huge transformation, like Bill is talking about with 50, 60,000 people, for example, in Roche is, is is probably too big of a pocket, right? So the question is, how do you create mm. these smaller pockets? And I'm with you, it probably needs to go via these pockets where, where I would probably say something else is, I think this whole regulation compliance is not contradicting with like the teal ideas of more purposeful working of self-organization sure. or self-management, probably not so much con contradicting with wholeness, right? It is more about, well, probably contradicting to certain agile processes. I would I would agree to that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because there there we probably have some regulations, some needs that we need to fulfill. But for more humane workplaces, you, you at least from my point of view, you can, you can be perfectly compliant mm -hmm. and still create that more humane workplace uh, following your your purpose. Uh, true, uh, comma. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is a, there is a translation going on. So uh, looking at all the. Uh, teal aspects and agile you did not say scrum and mm. we we didn't talk about how to implement stuff like teal going from the philosophy to to protocols mm. and that is where we might also work to to look at the the, the philosophies of teal might uh, tie very well together with highly regulated with gam5 mm. and, and and all of that in there but com um, translating that into context i think is really really important so you could 
you could uh, i have seen um teal aspects more fluent work uh definitely uh, before uh, first human dose in the early stages of innovation it makes sense uh, we are working in areas that are less predictive uh, less prescriptive even where we need to get new ideas rapidly where we need to test them out mm -hmm. and um in the it, when we go into production where things need to be rigid where things need to be in compliance the idea of for example lean actually ties into the philosophy of teal however there we we have the translation into protocols so the the overall I, idea of teal might be right but the translation alludes to that we need differences and what i really really like to look at are nuances nuances of teal nuances of uh, modern orange nuances of of uh, everything it's that's what i really really would like to to get at and maybe ken if we can get the first illustration of i have the idea of that more and more organizations thank you ken is looking at their organization as a platform on which small teams small pockets uh, emerge live do their job and then uh, evaporate again so all of these small teams they live on top of a platform and what i, I call it you can call it that a sustainable ecosystem it, it then consists of a lot of small elements can if we can have the, the next slide where i actually put them up in in this uh, three three by three grid where you can look at all of the elements that the top row is about the culture uh the organization as a platform culture and fellowship and, and how everybody in that world should have individual coaching the middle row is about distributing leadership about making decisions in a distributed world and the the lower row is all about okay how do we tie our teams together this translation of all these elements is then what is going to happen and that in you you could say that we have the the teal pocket in the middle, the teal dot, and then the other eight uh, uh, boxes are the modern version of orange, and that's uh, that's how I how I see it. Makes makes it makes a lot of sense, Eric. And, and I think um, for me, I mean, if, if we talk about the production area, for example, right, and about protocols and all these things, I'm I'm with you. I mean, we we, we need to follow certain processes there. We need to follow certain rules. Um, otherwise, mm -hmm. we're simply not compliant. So that that part I, I would agree with. On the other hand side, I think there's a lot of room also um, beyond protocols where you can say, well, their self-organization actually does work. Um, probably, I don't know about you, but at, at least from my experience, and not only in Roche and, and also in other pharma companies, is um, this uh, this principle of we have a 4i principle, uh, segregation of duty leads mm -hmm. to we have a 28i principle all of a sudden, right? And there's 15, 14, 15 people signing off documents where actually yeah. regulation says, well, two is good enough, right? For, for many, many things at least. Um, and, and then obviously there is that part, what, what I call the, the not necessarily core work of, for example, teams in manufacturing space. So we talk about performance practices. We talk about um, maybe all of the team collaboration topics that we are that we are having as well, where, where I think you can obviously probably um, be much more effective with a little bit of teal and self-management. I think I think that's a good point. Uh, in this, when we, when we start working with the teal principles, of which one of them is self-leadership, aka more mandate, more um, empowering, less control, uh it is stumbling close to also look at okay how can we reduce some of the the overhead of for example second pair of eyes third pair of eyes as you just said um some of the uh, um, some of the life science companies that i'm working with are looking at uh this not only in uh, the obvious places which might be uh r d but they are also looking at it in the support processes, for example, marketing or finance or legal, um, where we can we can uh, redesign our approach, uh, really and genuinely considering, first of all, the humane aspects. Second of all, can we do this faster if we give people the opportunity to make decisions themselves, uh, to make decisions in a clever way of course using something like the advice process or a variant here of where we, you ask the people who are either in, involved knows better or who are impacted um, and doing that we can document that you your decision processes goes from months to weeks 
or from weeks to days. So there's like a, a, a magnitude of decision process time that you can remove from, from embracing things like Teal. Mm. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the consent decision making instead of the consensus, which we see a lot in the in the in the industry. And and also uh, probably I had a recent conversation with a fairly senior guy in one of the pharma companies here in here in Switzerland, and and he said if we have an escalation for one of the manufacturing sites, we spend 90% of our time communicating to executive management and 10% we spend on solving the problem. And mm. that I think is part of the reason why these teal dots in an orange world probably do make a lot of sense in many, many ways. I think that's uh, that's definitely part of it. I, I know somebody who has a no no escalation principle and they even have a, have a standard text that he cut and paste into emails and send it back, <laughs> generally saying that, well, first of all, I the team knows better how to handle this issue. You are just wasting mine, yours, and the team's and the customer's time by escalating this. So please don't do that. I don't know, and I don't want to make the, the decision. It's a, it's a really fun. <laughs> nice. We got, we got one of the questions here from Maya from YouTube, I think, uh, who's, who's asking, is there any tips for unlearning? Is there, is there any tips for letting go, Eric, from, from your point of view? Because you probably need some courageous leader to put up that practice that you were just describing. Yeah, there are some 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 tricks to do that. Um, uh, I think it's it's um, uh, Aaron Dignan in his and uh, in their podcast Brave New Work. They mm. say do radical things on a non-radical scale, <laughs> and I I genuinely believe that. What I always do when when we try doing that is to set up experiments, and we scale it down and we start working with maybe four teams uh, in six eight weeks. And we make the experiments and try to work with self-leadership. See what happens. We are looking for, of course, we are looking for the, 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 the hardcore input output. But most of all, we are looking for what is the, the change management resistance. What might hold us back if we were to go into a phase two where we want to scale this up. If we want to unlearn some of these things, uh, don't go solo. It is really hard to just be solo doing this. You need somebody to team up with to say, Tim, you and I, we should do this. Can we, over the next two weeks, avoid CCing people on our emails? What will happen? Uh, but when you need to, to team up with somebody either in your leadership team, with your sister department, or with another leader who wants to go that way. You can never do that solo. So don't go solo and uh, small things on a non radicals. Do do radical things on a non-radical scale. That's how I would do that. <laughs> yeah, really love love that quote from Aaron yeah, Dignan good. as well. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a good a good way to go. And, and I think the the other thing just is acknowledge that unlearning certain patterns that we've built for 10, 20, 30 years just takes time as well. If we look at the broader organization, it's especially right. So it's always good to have allies and kind of uh, partners in in in, in uh, crime, as you as you said, Eric. We just don't have to go solo, and and, and you maybe can also learn about it, right? Because some things might make more sense, uh, and then once once you've done it, you figure out well, maybe it was not not the smartest idea there. So that's uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. I think uh, something that you also learn. But there there's that iterative way of learning and that letting go of certain things are uh, really helpful as well. Yeah, and and then um, speaking of that, if if you want to like, we are very slowly co coming towards the size of a pocket. <laughs> we we will get there. <laughs> if if you start working in in your pocket, one good advice from me uh, at least is to get your leader above or around to to talk to your interface to say we are going to do something different. It might taste differently to you also because you we have a work interface. Uh, you might new, meet new people, new roles, new words, new slang, new dialects. So I, uh, I prepare you for meeting a new world. And over the next six weeks, six months, we are going to do something different. We might miss a deadline. We might uh, uh, get some, some, uh, some sad or mad stakeholders, of which you might be one of them. But you should just know that we are trying to do something. If we succeed, we will help you also to get to know what we're doing. So uh, don't go solo, do radical things on a non-radical scale and then get your leader to work with your interface stakeholder. That's definitely something that I uh, advise you to do. 
Totally, to totally agree with that part, Eric. And maybe also interesting, you, you were just touching on language, right? Because yeah. you might need to learn a new set of languages and, 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 and words, really. One thing that I've seen the other way around is that people call everything like tribes and squads and chapters upside down and actually with not changing anything else. But you're not a team leader anymore, Eric. You're now a chapter lead and everything else stays, stays the same, right? So we got a new mm -hmm. language with actually nothing radical happening, not even at a small scale. So what's your, what's your advice around language, maybe? Mm. Well, well, don't do it if it's not physically changed. Don't do it as a uh, stafash. Don't do it just as putting new words to things. Uh, however, words can actually be pretty, pretty powerful. I don't know if you read the book by David McKay about where he goes mm. on the submarine. What's the name? Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, one of the things that he is, is using that he's avoiding the word, I have a plan. Instead, I have intentions. And, and just that switch of language from, from planning to having intentions uh, indicates that I want to involve you, that the, the direction in which I'm going might change over time. Also, what, what I'm trying to do is to avoid giving feedback, but giving my perspective, alluding back to one of the things that are in, in Teal, which is the wholeness. Uh, I respect you, Tim. I am not here to give you feedback, uh, thereby indicating that I know better than you. I just share my perspective with you uh, on an eye to eye level. So there are some power in genuinely switching one of the some of your languages. One of the, the vital signs I can see from leadership teams that are actually changing is that their balance, the ratio between feminine and masculine language is changing. Mm -hmm. They are using more feminine language. They are including, involving, sharing vulnerabilities and taking care of hard KPIs, being powerful. Uh, so that ratio is changing. That's really interesting. Yeah, true. And and we are lucky there, Eric, because we got some smart people here on YouTube uh, telling us that the book is called Turn the Ship Around, of course. Yeah. Uh, oh, right? thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's over I there. So then I'm, I have <laughs> actually seen him uh, maybe. Maybe a handful of times uh, presenting David McKay. So thank you to mm. all for uh, yeah. for and and I'm and I'm fully with you. It is it is interesting how that language shift makes a difference. I think the the, the important thing is really uh, only use different language. One, if you're serious about it, obviously mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. true change, and then really change something, right? So that's that's mm. that's, that's that's what you also said, Eric, because you'll be losing credibility in no time as a leader if you just call it attention instead of a plan and you do the same thing and you're directing and controlling the people and just telling them what to do in the next whatever five months then yeah. obviously that new language will not help a lot true and speaking of of change because that is also what we are we are working with it's transformation it's change management it's it's, it's habits now we come to the to the size of a pocket and that's actually but one of the the reasons for me to to look at the size of these pockets is to understand how fast and how genuine and how involving we can make our organizational change management and now just park that sentence for a bit uh, robin dunbar made some very nice studies when it comes to, to, to the size of tribes. Mm. And he came up with the uh, number of 150 being, uh, at least on the Western Hemisphere, uh, the size of a tribe that we can uh, relate to. I can know, I can recognize the faces of a tribe of that size. Diving into the details of uh, all that aspects of, of, of tribes and anthropology, uh, a number series pops up where it's not only 150, it's 5, 15, 50, 150, and then 500 and 1500. But those 5, 15, 50, and 150 are, in my learning from doing this for maybe 15 years, uh, the size of pockets, where you can have, first of all, connectivity, relationships, social capital, and from a change management per perspective, you can relate to people. You can take, you can make them feel part of something because you have a size that you can overlook, that you can, can relate to. And that's the size of the teal dots of the pockets. And that's the size of the change management effort that makes sense. And when it comes beyond 150, well, that's where we get the modern orange. Mm -hmm. So that's how it ties together. Yeah. Fully with you on that one, Eric. And I mean, there's a good reasons for militaries across the globe, actually, not just in the Western part for having yeah. that group size of 150, because you need to be relatable to your colleagues there, especially in the, in the, good point. in the, in the, in the real case there. Um, but so 
question then, Eric, is obviously, what if my um, area, my my business unit, my site locally, somewhere commercial affiliate maybe, is five, six, eight hundred people big? Um, mm. Would you would you suggest that all of these one hundred fifty uh, pocket or 150 people pockets go off and do their own thing what's the what's the need you, you think for kind of harmonization and alignment and doing the same versus what's the autonomy for every of the pockets if you want to bring it together on a on a bigger level yeah the the classic answer is it depends <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, there, there are some of these pockets who are uh, by design by birth uh, nearly uh, born into just going fully autonomous uh because it, it's they are pretty isolated maybe you have an affiliate of 150 people maybe you have an affiliate of 50 people um where it, it just makes so much sense just to kind of cut loose and go with that and still staying in contact um, then you have some affiliates or business units that might be bigger like 1500 employees uh looking in a careful way on how we can first of all make the experiments and second of all how can we slice and dice that in chunks that are sensible that are meaningful we we don't have to force it into these these pockets but it's also it's a base of uh, a combination of um the business process the uh, cash flow also what processes what process interfaces are there uh, how autonomous are people working are they working in in teams are they are we having like a a a, a project organization where by nature they are flocking together so there are many many aspects into that uh, in which each each of these pockets then should have an idea about um, what will make most sense is the hierarchy good Good. Then go do that because it it makes uh, it makes it predictable. It makes people have a lot of comfort. Or do you want to go flatter? Do you want to go teal? Do you want to go whole accuracy? Well, make an experiment in your pocket, and then the the balance is to understand the that you both need uh, autonomy and alignment. Mm which is a paradox we know that but but staying in in touch having your autonomous pocket but staying enough in touch to have the pocket go the pockets in in plural go the same way that's definitely some some aspect to it yeah that's 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 one of the most interesting aspects i think autonomy and alignment because that indeed contradicts at least in the first place and one of the big challenges in huge multinational companies, which we also have in the life sciences industry, obviously, is um, you have so many touch points to the organization around you, right? It is, and it's really complex, usually. Um, so that means that autonomy is, is one part, but how do you um, get that alignment, knowing that you have 20 different stakeholders across the globe with all sorts of different connections and, and interfaces? Yeah. So yeah. any magic bullet there, Eric? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say, uh, Ken, if we can get the second illustration up and just look at the bottom row, uh, uh, that will really help us because I'm I'm trying to navigate in in that area. I don't know if Ken can pull that up. But what what we are we're looking at right now? Yeah, thank you, Ken. The the bottom row here. We're looking at the white space. Mm -hmm. The white space is a terminology that I just borrowed slash boldly stole from mm -hmm. um, uh, program management. When you have several projects and in a program you have white space, which is the gap between projects. And what we're looking at here, Tim, is actually the gap between teams, the gaps between stakeholders. Uh, and thank you for, for sharing, Ken. We can take that away again. Um, uh, what we're looking at is to try to navigate a more flat hierarchy of, of flat organization and just kind of looking over to see what, what are the other people doing. And, and if you get that image of that, that all of these teams are on the same level, it's really hard to look to the other teams and for the for the leaders to take part of actually moving uh moving uh, learnings moving money moving people moving experiences moving stakeholders views getting people to bump into each other to have a good friction that's one of the aspects that leaders need to take care of to close the wide gap we we want the teams to have the feeling of connectivity belonging and uh nearly creating i'm i'm not going to say this i'm going to say that nearly creating a new silo <laughs> but a a silo where, where they work so much together but it's more dynamic where they when they get the tap on the shoulder to hey tim you need to look to that team because they are doing something clever 
that you might learn from. So the, the leaders need to create this fluent or buoyant um, uh, ecosystem to close that white gap, the white mm -hmm. space. Yeah, the white the white space concept is, is something that I do like as well, and I think there's there's another aspect to it because uh, Maya earlier asked how can we let go of certain things and and how how can we unlearn certain things? And I think one of the things to unlearn to truly provide that autonomy is obviously that leadership needs to let go of certain things. So I'm almost like, mm. don't let just go of some things. What about if leaders are now mainly taking care of filling that white space for their teams, letting go for everything that's happening in that pocket? and taking care of all of the interfaces of the white space uh, stuff. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. And I think it's, it's really tough to do that change because we are so grown into the habits yeah. of if we have a, if we have a question, uh, if we are challenged, if we are curious or nervous, we can go to our leaders yeah. who then, because that's what they get paid for, solve the problem magically. And, and th this is going to change from both sides. Both we as team members, we need to take that upon us ourselves to see, okay, there is a problem. I might I might just dive into that problem to actually solve it. If I cannot solve it, I might call a leader to see we have a problem. Can we solve this together? Not just to push problems away. Um, so that's from team side. And leaders need to change um, habits also and understand that they are not necessarily only seen as decision makers. But as you mm. say, uh, to facilitators. Yeah. Indeed, and I think that's that's um, one part of the conversation that I'm missing in many, many places is we're just talking about leaders need to let go. I think both Eric and I agree to that. But who's taking up the ball? Who's making sure the ball is not dropping, right? And mm. obviously, if, if there's a serious problem, then it's always easier to escalate the, the whole topic a level or two up rather than taking care of myself, being being exposed myself. So there's all, also that other side. Everyone needs to take more accountability in that, let's say, more autonomous, more tealish uh, space as well. So what's your, what's your, what's your guidance for, for, for teams? There? How, how can you learn that pattern of taking on accountability, actually? Hmm. That's a good question. What I can see from, from doing these tr transformations, there, it, I have a feeling that when we go into, uh, well, the first phase is the experimentation. When we go into the second phase of the scale up, something like four, five, six months into that, the teams start to get that revelation of, oh, there's a problem and nobody is actually solving that. Maybe we should take our blindfolds off just for a second and just look at that problem. They start within four, four five, six months to, to see other problems beyond their own realm. And that's where you need to, 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 to pinpoint those who have that mental cap capability or the, or the bandwidth to see a problem and, and, and raise it. One way to try to do that or strive towards doing that is to have some well, it inspired by Agile and, and Scrum, some regular meetups where you share your per perspectives. What have you done? What have you learned? What challenges do you see? Not reporting, but sharing perspectives. And that where you as leader slash facilitator, as you say, can maybe get a sense of uh, that something is lurking, that uh, where we need to dive into. Definitely agree there, Eric. Another question that I get quite a lot is, um, I mean, we are, we're always saying leadership needs to let go, right? And then at the same time, at least I'm saying, and I'm not sure if, if, if you do the same, but especially through a transformation, through an experiment of these rather radical things, you will need leadership, right? And you will need direction. And that's mm -hmm. almost like the next paradox, right? We're asking leaders to step back. And at the same time, we are asking them to provide more leadership because that change, that transition, that transformation that's happening requires a lot of leadership. So how do you how do you handle that contradiction or that that paradox? Hmm. Uh, I think going going for let's stick with with teal. Let's if going for for teal pockets. The amount of leadership that is needed is definitely going to be higher. And it, we, we need more people to chip into that and be part of taking leadership in several aspects. It can be business-wise, it can be production-wise, it can be specialist-wise or interpersonal or intrapersonal-wise. There are more leadership uh, that needs to be, be, uh, be handled by more people. I'm not necessarily sure that we need more leaders. So we are going to look into changing some of the hierarchies 
They are going to evolve. Maybe they are going to be flatter. Maybe some of the the people who who takes roles and their uh, professional and nice roles might um, fulfill other roles better than what they do right now. We we're not firing people. We're just sh shuffling them into places where they provide more impact, where their roles are, or where their energy and time are better spent. Uh, that's that's what I can see. Definitely, maybe uh, Eric. Coming, coming back a bit to our life sciences uh, pharma theme for today. So for all of the things we talked about, white spaces, leadership, leading through change as well, um, uh, probably having a different style of leadership or also probably reinventing the hierarchy to a certain extent. So mm -hmm. what do you think, which of, which of these aspects are truly uh, special and different in the life sciences industry compared to other industries? Or would you say, you know what, it's all the same in every industry really? Now, one thing that is uh, is, is special. There, there are two things that that uh, that pops up working with with the life science industry. One is um, purposeful. We are really doing this for the patient. We are doing this to save the world. We are working with oncology, or we are working with uh, thrombosis, or we like generally we are trying to make uh, life better for the patients. Uh, so the 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 reasoning for doing stuff is uh, more often in the forefront of people what they what they are doing why they are doing stuff and why they make strategic or operational decisions. Second of all, um, for the exact same reason, there is uh, there is uh, highly regulated processes. We might end up killing people if we don't take care of that, and that highly regulated way of working might in some companies uh, traverse into, for example, how you manage your Excel sheets, <laughs> how you manage your naming on SharePoint folders, how you, uh, how you have your meetings, how you make decisions. So that built-in, um, highly regulated, uh, uh, strong inertia then traverts into other places. That's what I see, and that's that's what different than working in some of the other areas that are, uh, for pro professional reasons, less regulated. And that's what we have to to uh, to struggle with when we when we start. Tim and I, for example, when you start talking about uh, more mandate, uh, uh, more empowering, uh, faster d decisions at frontline, stuff like that. Then we are we are uh, working against uh, strong habits uh, that we need to be very much aware of. So purpose and regulations that are traversing into our Excel sheets. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I mean, one 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 thing from my experience that's that's really important indeed is I mean the purpose topic is fairly straightforward. I think indeed in mm -hmm. pharma, and we 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 do that work because we care about patients. I think the other thing is that. Um, certain language needs a translation into pharma life sciences reality. For mm. example, if we talk about minimal viable product, we're not talking about a, an 80-20 ready medicine or pill, right? So mm. MVP means something else for a product that we ship to a patient who's actually relying on medicine. And and, and probably we are, we're talking about an MVP in a different way if you look into certain manufacturing sites as well, right? Because probably we don't want an 80-20 solution for that manufacturing mm cleanliness or something like that right so we so we don't yeah. want that and also that whole thing around failure culture experimenting iterative ways of working i think it's just something that needs to get translated into reality of life sciences industry mm. compared to for example software development and these and these kind of things mm. yeah it's a good point it's a good point because and, and now we're also talking about well the first reaction we sometimes get when we talk about moving new ways of working into the highly regulated industries being life science or being uh, nuclear power plants which i have <laughs> i had a phone call last fall from a nuclear power plant who wanted to go scrum uh, <laughs> it's to see okay so what are the nuances what are the nuances that we're actually talking about yes we have a we have a key process um phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. But just beside that, there are some support processes. And that is where we might work with uh, minimal viable products, minimal viable products, where we might work with Agile and Scrum in a, in a different way. So getting as close, but not uh, not stupidly close to the key process. That's, uh, that's where we can see these nuances. For example, when we go into have like, like marketing campaigns, how can we do that in a more agile way if we want to go 
and have uh, uh, public relations and all of that. So we, we are, we're looking at all the nuances uh, mm. on that. And and I think we, we can we can even build on that for the for the core process in in pharma, uh, for example, being research and development. I mean, at least how I translate MVPs in the pharma world usually is, you actually have an MVP with, for example, first in human studies. Mm -hmm. You don't have a ready to use pill for Eric and Tim out there as patients, but you do have an MVP saying it is safe enough to try first in human, and it is safe enough for phase two, it is safe enough for phase three, and it is safe enough for the market. So it is kind of an MVP approach, really, right? Just on a different timeline, actually, right? Because we're talking about years and decades, partially. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, not not in sprints like uh, I don't know Scrum in two four weeks or something, right? But that mm -hmm. that is in fact an MVP process to a certain extent. That whole clinical <laughs> process. I think that's a good point, and and tying into that is uh, also as uh, and you said it before, Tim. Also, the the uh, um, embracing failure, or more like mm. embracing learning, yeah. and actually to start working in iterations to like plan for three months horizons, then stop, learn, adjust, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. I think that is it. It is actually what. What the, the life science industry is all about is about, okay, this molecule, what can it actually do? How, what kind of side effects does it have? What kind of toxicity to, does it have? Can, can, we, can we fumble our way into learning? And the, so it's built on that. And at some point it gets more rigid because when then we go into scale up. Um, but, but that idea of working in iterations, looking for the learning rather than avoiding failure, I think that's a mental change. Totally agree. And and I know about your experience, but mine is indeed what you're mentioning, experimentation and failure, kind of at the heart of every pharma company. And at the same time, it's such a difficult concept to unlearn certain patterns that we've learned over over the over the time, right? Failure and, and experimentation seems to be something that's, that's almost kind of stigmatized in the in the pharma life sciences world, I think. Yeah, we also have some some very grim cases of where the where the uh, the side effects wasn't taken care of, uh, yeah. like in the sectors. Uh, we all know that, um, and that's the the stigma that we want to avoid. And that's why we that people really really test because we want to avoid having those those side effects, those unwanted side effects. Definitely. Um, maybe another theme that that I see coming up a lot is obviously innovation, especially first first world countries, right, are fairly expensive. So we always talk about innovation. And there's really interesting studies suggesting that more experts, less innovation. So there's a direct negative correlation. More experts involved in the decision making mm. process, less innovation. Reason is pretty mm. simple, because we'll always find an expert who's objecting and saying that's the wrong way to go. And then you end up with some kind of diluted compromise and and, and, and solution. So anyway, uh, I, was, I was just wondering on, on, on your thoughts around, well, how can that whole teal dots idea help for actually the core business of life sciences, which is innovation? I think it, it ties very well together. Uh, I have a feeling that some of the um, some of the uh, old-fashioned uh, therapy areas, therapeutic areas, uh, are starting to to cross-pollinate right now, mm. uh, where we are more looking at life, lifestyles, uh, lifestyle d d diseases, uh, which at one point we might all be. Uh, sick to a certain degree. <laughs> it's it's a matter of what is, what is that scale. That is that, that is really changing how we how we look at uh, what is uh, illness. What does it uh, take for us to be healthy? What's the the definition of health? Second of all, there is uh, there's so much uh, technology now moving into the uh, to the life science area when it comes to to health tech. Like we can use our phones to go to the, to the doctor. Uh, who owns our data? How can we get that, get a hold of that data, and use that in our science? So that area of of, of working is changing. Uh, the third part is that um, uh, going back to the uh, to the finance industry and going back to disruption at that point, that like five or ten years ago, a bunch of new fintech companies popped up like, pop, 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 that that can solve a very small problem very very fast but not scale it. And that's exactly what, what is also now happening in the life science industry, that we have a lot of small companies who get a, lo a lot of funding, maybe find one molecule for one therapeutic area, 
but is not either willing or want to get it into compliance, to file it and to scale it up. That's where the 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 uh, collaboration between the small life science companies and the bigger life science companies actually comes into play. That is where something like Teal could pop in to say, okay, how can we genuinely co collaborate? How do we tr trust each other? How do we build MVPs? How do we embrace a Scrum-like thinking in iterations? So that that interface is really changing right now. I can see I can see that. I mean, equal ecosystem thinking is one one of the topics that always comes up, right? And, and we talk about bigger companies, smaller companies, the startup world, but we're also talking about patient advisory groups. We're talking about authorities, obviously. We're talking about the doctors and, and hospitals. So, what's the what's your what's your thoughts around building this ecosystem type of approach linked to a mindset of abundance that's usually mentioned as well? There, I think it is happening right now as we talk. Uh, the barriers, or the the walls between competitors are are falling down. The wall between the companies and uh, let's say politicians and uh, universities and uh, local scientists and uh, healthcare industries, local healthcare industries. It is uh, and the hospitals and the GPs. It is it is uh, they are more and more sharing data with each other. First of all, because we can. Second of all, it's interesting. <laughs> to generally know how we can uh, save uh, more lives for, for less money. How can we do that um, so we can get all of the world to have a COVID-19 vaccine fast enough and not just us white guys? Mm. Uh, that's a general problem that people are really trying to solve together in the ecosystem. Nice, uh, Eric. I think uh, we've, we've talked a lot about theory and concepts and and, uh, and some some of yeah. the practical ideas as well. But what's your what's your favorite example of a teal dot in an in an orange life science world? Something really tangible where maybe our viewers on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn can say, you know what, I'll try that radical mm -hmm. idea on a non radical scale tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I'm working with a life science company where we, in the uh, very early phases of, uh, well, before first human dose, are trying to work with self-led teams. Oh, uh, so how, what does it actually take to have a self-led team in an innovation organization or research uh, department? Uh, what kind of, uh, of, uh, of interface to other people's does that actually take? And, and we have a talk about that. What does it take for them to be autonomous? and still have, uh, have, uh, have alignment with the other teams. That's one of my favorite examples right now. Uh, I'm also working with, um, with some, some, uh, some of the support people in another area, I'm not going to say who, uh, where they are genuinely thinking about, okay, we as finance guys or legal guys, why do we have to make the decisions? Why don't we flip? the coin and say okay now we set more of the budget free or more of the legal stuff free uh we will go out with to you with our expertise sit with you work together jointly and not just uh, tra uh um tra tra transactions but genuinely working and collaborating together i think that's uh that's really chill I, I really really like that thinking why do i have to make decisions when we can do that jointly hmm. That's, that's actually a really good point. I also do like a practice of one of our big medical device companies we're having here in Basel. It's a, it's a few thousand people big. And what they've introduced a few years back is that the corporate executive committee, so the CEO and, and, and all of his leadership team, that they would make their meetings public via mm. virtual tech technology actually right so everyone could dial in from the few thousand people and just listen into the ceo meeting basically and obviously in the beginning was a huge hype right everyone's really interested in what's what's mm. happening that fancy interesting meeting and i think eric and i we've, mm. we've both been there it's not always that interesting really mm. um but obviously it, it breaks that whole myth around well there's something behind closed doors ivory tower going on right and mm. i i think it's a pretty nice practice actually that doesn't take a lot because you probably have something online going on anyway so and if you put everyone on on mute and just have your conversations minus the people sensitive topics because you're probably not allowed from regulation but the rest is actually really good for also providing that context so we talked about capability building before right mm -hmm. letting go of certain things having leadership from different places so i think that's that's also quite a nice practice might be radical on a CEO level, but I think if you do that on a business unit level or, or somewhere, it is actually probably doable. Yeah, 
I think it's a good point. One of the uh, one of the leadership groups that I work with, they they have their uh, Tuesday morning meeting in public uh, in front of a a whiteboard. Well, they used to have pre-COVID. Now they have it <laughs> online. Uh, but they, as you said, Tim, I think ninety percent of their discussions can be public, and that hmm. that's what they they Indeed. strive to do. That it's it it's really really powerful to do that. Absolutely. Um, we got another question here from uh, YouTube, Eric, from Maya, actually. If we have any clarification on the difference between self-led teams, self-organized teams, and self-managed teams. Mm. So that, that's okay. an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I normally use uh, a leader-led, uh, self-organized, and self-managed. Uh, that's uh, like three buckets. Uh, self-led teams, self-organized. Self self-led and self-managed might be variants of the same teams with a leader there you have the leader who makes all calls for what is going on uh, what we do why we do and who does stuff when we go in and are self-organized that's the next step you still have a leader but uh, the leader do, does not decide who does what just takes part of the prioritization and the talk with the stakeholders and all the interfaces outside and then plops the tasks into the uh, to the pocket and then the the people in the pocket the pocket people, <laughs> then uh, then then organize and find out how to do that. If you're self-led or self-managed, well, then uh, there is no leader. There is generally no leader who handles the prioritization and who does all that. So you you find out that yourself. That is tough. Uh, for example, if if Tim, if you and I are on a self-led team, and if we get into a quarrel, we have a tension, we disagree, we we fight. Uh, there is no leader to actually solve that. We need to find that out ourselves. So how can we mitigate or mediate the controversy that, that we have? So the the less present the leader is in the team, the more self-led you are. So there are some, some good definitions on that. Yeah, indeed. There is there's also a matrix or a, 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 a graph with two axes, I think, that, that you could look up if, if you're in, interested in that. Anyone? I think the, the, the key thing for me is, one, I agree with your definition, Eric, that, that's one thing. But the other thing is, no matter what kind of terminology you're using, make sure you define it. Because I've, I've seen it ah. mixed up and confused in like almost every place, right? So make yeah. sure you define it. And if you're not following Eric's definition, what a self-organized, self-led, self-managed team is, that's okay, as long as you have a clear definition of what self-managed means for you in your context, in your specific setup, I think. I think that's a very, very good point. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> Agree. Exactly. And then when you start working with it, then find out where you disagree and then change it. Change it when you learn that it was stupid what we wrote. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and by the way, point. I think that's, that's, that's not only true for self-organized, self-led and all that. Also true for what does agility mean for us? What does iterative ways of working mean for us? What does, uh, I don't know, certain ways of decision making mean for us, right? So there's, there's, it's always good to have a minimal little bit of documentation, at least. I mean, I'm not uh, suggesting that everyone writes a book about their governance and, and their structures and everything, but certain definitions do make a lot of sense, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah, then then you can go all the way and and look at the protocol of holacracy. You <laughs> yeah. might not want to go there, but that is uh, that is uh, that is possible. <laughs> yeah, true indeed. Yeah, that's yeah. that's um, that's probably also an interesting conversation for another time, maybe around <laughs> holacracy and all of all of these frameworks. I'm yeah. pretty sure we are we're also fairly aligned on that one, Eric. Anyway, um, one 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 more question that that I had for you, Eric. So. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I don't know who's online today, but I'm guessing that teal and agility and all these topics, uh, obviously, some some topic that HR is really interested about. So, any any suggestions, any hints, anything where you say, "Hey, dear HR folks out there, what should they take care of from your point of view?" Oh, that's a good one, and it's a very sensitive topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that HR people should genuinely try to get an understanding of what is futures thinking. They should really lean, lean forward. And I, I, I really mean that. Watch all the YouTubes. Watch all the, the TED Talks about futures thinking. Dive into that area. What does it actually mean to make a forecast, to make a backcast? What is the trends that are affecting us when it comes to to purpose, when it comes to technology, when it comes to so sociology, be the knowledge anchor internally of what futures are coming. And then take that knowledge and then lean forward, be the, well, the, um, the business partner 
for the, the pocket that you're working with. Be the anchor, be out there with them. So, and, and bring, bring then your wholeness, your heart, your humanism into that conversation. So futures thinking, business understanding, uh, trend understanding, and humanism, take that out and be work with the, with the team to solve those problems with you that might occur. That's, uh, that's how I see it. Really good. I think we can we can uh, touch on the futures or future versus futures in in a, in a second as well. I think there's one additional suggestion that I have always is uh, don't pull the brake on all the experiments because that's that's what I'm mm. seeing a lot. Not only from HR, by the way, right from many of these group group functions, these cent, cent, central functions, there is a tendency to pull a brake on some of the experiments rather than being pragmatic about it. Um, but Eric. You also mentioned that in the in the beginning, right? Future thinking versus futures thinking. So let's let's have a little chat about that. Good. Uh, future thinking is actually something that we have been doing for many of us for centuries, where we think about the future uh, and we plan for the future. We and it's called an anticipatory thinking. I anticipate something will happen. If I, if I drop this pen, it's going to fall. That's your anticipation. It happened. So we are confirming our assumption. That is future thinking in singularities. If we then start to say, okay, what might happen if we try to change stuff? And also from that, what might happen? What do we prefer happening? So we have, a, we have variants. We have c scenarios in plural that might happen. And some of these scenarios might be one that we prefer. And then we start investing in that. That can be driven from where we are today. It's called uh, forecasting. Or it can be dreamt out of our head. See, we want to go here. And then we backcast. How can we get there? So the, the futures thinking is like a, a cone of options of which some is predictable and some is probable and some is preferable. And if we get that understanding into... What do we do when we make strategy? Then, then we can start having a new uh, uh, terminology, uh, speaking of words again. Yeah, great, great perspective, Eric, and I think really good input. Uh, let's take one last question from from Gunnar there. Um, any thoughts on how to move from an unaligned autonomous team or culture to an aligned and autonomous group? So, what's the what's the thoughts there, Eric? Uh, any thoughts on going from to an aligned and autonomous group? Uh, yeah. So the the I honestly believe going in that way, there is a built-in paradox where we first of all uh, we need to say, and uh, to, yeah, we, we need to say that this is what we are going to do. We are going to go that way. You need to be descriptive, uh, expectation management to so say this is going to happen. Then the next step is to, uh, funny enough, remove autonomy. To train people in certain ways, you need to do this, use this process, use this word, use these templates. So you need to train people in a specific way and you need to make sure that they are heard to what we agree. And then over time, you can start playing more jazz above that. So there's a, there's a built-in contradiction in actually removing autonomy in some months in order to rebuild autonomy when people have learned you can say that how to be aligned that's how i that's how i see it that, that, that's how i have made it made it work uh, in 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 practice actually but you you need to be very vocal about i'm <laughs> taking away aut autonomy we have to do this process we have to work in that way and then when we have learned it then we can play jazz on top of that yeah really like it eric really really good advice uh, there's there's also a paradox that i like which is uh, structure leads to autonomy so rebuilding certain structure will lead to autonomy midterm a uh, really good one i think um so we got two minutes left there's uh, one thing i want to share with you and ken will get it up on screen i think there is uh, a next living room com conversation coming up obviously um and we do have a webinar coming up on June 15th, which is uh, around post-COVID leadership, uh, probably one of the hot topics right now um, from Semco Style with Semco Style. And then we have on June 10th, uh, even before that, we have a little living room conversation at same living room here uh, about 
designing experience in a virtual and hybrid space uh, because what we are likely going to see is we're going partially back to the office partially we're going back to face to face but not everyone is in the same place most likely so that hybrid space i think is an incredibly interesting one so if you guys out there on youtube linkedin and facebook have time feel free to join unfortunately it will not be eric and me there so that's that's the downside of that one obviously um but with that eric thanks a lot for taking the time thank you for being here in this little living room really a pleasure thanks for the great conversation and i hope the people out there enjoyed it too and can enjoy the rest of the afternoon eric thanks very much thank you too it was a nice sofa that we sat in <laughs> indeed yeah <laughs> pleasure good enjoy your afternoon everyone thank you thank you